Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody, Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing lo- helping people with hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, to the hearing loss from his radiation to his brain tumor, and then later when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT, who's performed over 10,000 surgeries and cared for many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of the Listen Up Hearing Centers. If I'm the author of a book of the same name, Listen Up, Hear- Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about either of them, go to www.listenuphearing.com. Today, I'm excited. We have a great guest. It's uh, Kat Penno. She just pedaled into the office to do this, she told me. She's the Director of Hearing Health. She leads New Hira's range of hearing health services. She was formerly the president and founder of the Hearing Collective, which provides hearing consultation for businesses and is described as an entrepreneurial clinical audio- audiologist and globally recognized thought leader and practitioner in teleaudiology, which is the delivery of audiology services remotely. It's a great topic and it's really interesting. She holds a master's of clinical audiology from the University of Western Australia, where she is currently a guest lecturer. Here she is, so we're great to have you. Thanks for coming on. We're excited to have you. Welcome. I'm pumped to be here. Thanks so much for hosting, Mark. Uh, and thanks a, for the intro. That's a New York City accent I hear, I think. Uh, it's not. Uh, Australian-based, Perth, Western Australia. So I think uh, we're 15 hours apart, so I really yeah. appreciate your time as well. Yeah, so it's uh, Cat's morning, my afternoon. Um, so I appreciate the coordination of time. So, uh, to, you know, uh, always fascinating, you know, you're in the, the world of hearing and somehow you got there. Tell, tell us mm-hmm. a little bit about how you uh, went from, you know, not being in the hearing space to being in the hearing space. What took you there? Yeah, for sure. Um, it's a bit of a curly story. So I did my bachelor's, which is my undergrad studies in economics and management. And in Perth, at the time I graduated, I was really fortunate to ride the mining or the resources boom. So a lot of us got employed before we graduated. And um, I was just really interested in micro and macroeconomics when I was um, in uh, in high school, secondary schooling. And I sort of just followed this natural uh, black sheep of the family trajectory because everybody else in my family is um, in the healthcare field. Oh, okay. So, of course, you were interested in micro and macro yes. economics. And I'm the middle child, so I was very much like, no, I definitely won't be pursuing anything in that in that sphere. And along the way, I used to look after and work for an ENT, actually, and nanny his children and tutor them as we, as we all progressively got older. And I said, I think I, I want to change in my early 20s. And he said, oh, um, what do you think of doing? There's this big big um, trend in Australia for students to really be interested in physiotherapy. And I remember at the time, because I had a bit of life experience and a full-time career prior to coming into audiology, thinking, wow, there's like 400 university students for this one undergrad course and master's course of physiotherapy. My odds of getting a job and having to start again are really slim. So I just saw the market and it was saturated. So I looked into other allied health professions, speech pathology. Clinical audiology wasn't on my radar because it's um, I suppose it's pretty it's a very niche field. And I think it was just really serendipitous in a way that I work used to work with this ENT and his family. And I remember standing in his backyard, and I'm still um, colleagues and friends with him now, and I'll always say to him, I really appreciate that conversation. Said, look, Kat, I think apply for put put you know um, your hats and all the basket if you in if you like, uh, because audiology is pretty competitive to get into here. At the time, they only took about twenty or thirty students biannually, and that's due to clinical placements. And I thought, gosh, yeah, that's really slim uh, chance of getting in. And I applied, and I and I got into the masters of clinical audiology and speech pathology at the time. I was really interested in communication and communication disorders, and we have. Um, a, I saw a lot of people in my family with hearing loss, not understanding it then, uh, but growing up with my grandparents and now looking back and reflecting on that time together uh, as a child, I can identify with what that is and empathise with a lot of our clients who, um, when I used to work clinically, would come in. So I got in and that was awesome. 
and I was uh, mid twenties then. Graduated, and here I am today. I, I did my thesis. I was I was very lucky at the time to be supervised by Dr. Robert Patuzzi. Um, he had a really unique style of teaching, and if you've ever encountered him or his works, you may or may not agree. And I'm really fortunate to have had him because after my cohort, uh, he retired, and he was really. Um, important in shaping the way that I think about the future of audiology and back in 2014 he just he had this image where he described uh, the traditional model of healthcare would really change he and he didn't really predict when but he said in a few years the way my cohort would practice would be you could all be sitting at home you would do remote services like this and You know, Kat, you might be here in Perth, Western Australia and see someone who's um, in Beijing, uh, China, and you would do a remote consult. I remember being like, that is a really cool image and I look forward to working in this very remote virtual um, office one day. And then I did my thesis in online service deliveries. And so it had always been ingrained in me. I really had that image um, clearly defined over uh, over my years of study and then I travelled. When my husband and I got married, we were we were, went away for four or five months, and I met a lot of digital nomads. And I think that's what really gave me the um, confidence to come back and try things a little bit differently in regards to how to deliver services. Because it, I don't know if if you um, remember this statistic, Mark, but the fact that people find out, let's say mid sixties, that they have hearing difficulties or a hearing confirmed hearing loss and then they wait on average eight to nine years to do something about it so plus eight you're almost in your 70s to me that is an unacceptable statistic uh, that uh, my understanding is it hasn't changed that much Um, and I've been in the field close to coming up to 10 years so uh, I feel like that's uh, one of my real passions and goals is to be proactive when it comes to not just hearing health, but healthcare in general. No, I agree with you. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it, it really, uh, you know, takes the exploration of why does that occur, right? And I think obviously it's not, if it were a single factor, <laughs> we'd be able to solve it very, very easily, obviously. Yes. It's multiple factor. I think there are some baked in assumptions in our field. And then there are some, I think, underappreciated assumptions. Um, and so I have my own, you know, hypotheses about it, but I'm, I'm fascinated to hear what you think about that issue and how you can make that better. That, uh, so as you said in the intro, that's, that's why I went off to explore and, and do my own uh, small business because I thought I could just learn things along the way, which I did. And then this opportunity at New Hero came up um, and what I really love I know you've interviewed our CEO, John Luna, which was really cool. Um, Like he said, our average age of consumer is in their early 50s, so 53, 54, and to me that blows my mind. And some of the data I see here, um, it's it's crazy because our product is geared towards mild hearing losses, right? But people will come to us with hearing losses that are more severe than that, and we know that people don't have a good gauge of what their hearing loss actually is. Yeah. compared to other. I think it's so fascinating. Studies. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, through my own poking around, you know, all of these surveys, right? So there's all these handicap assessments and all of that. But if you go and you look at the work, they actually don't correlate with the audiogram, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. So and people's perception of their hearing loss and their real hearing loss are just disparate. And that totally blows my mind that the audiogram is 100 plus years old and, and we're so still in, in Australia when we're taught from, from the tertiary and our master courses up that that is one of our main tools. And, and I'm not trying to say that um, it's not needed. It, it certainly is. Uh, but we've got to look at things in a, in a broader sense because when I think about hearing health and what we are tackling, it's this change in behaviour. Yeah, very I mean, longitudinal I mean, sense. the audiogram is just a graphical representation of data points demonstrating hearing loss in various frequencies, right? And so, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I agree with you that people overemphasize it, but on the flip side, it does represent a deficit at a certain frequency range across a, as, a, as a matter of sampling, if that makes sense. 
It, it totally does. And so that I think if that's where we're starting, where should we be going next? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, it's interesting from an audiological point of view, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I've looked at the data and I know there's a lot of online screening. So, you know, the one question I always ask people is, is how do you do discrimination, which is obviously not been really figured out yet. In other words, for the mm -hmm. audience, your ability to not just hear tones, but your ability to actually comprehend language space, uh, presented at a certain level. So that's obviously a, a more in-depth metric. I think that, you know, personally, my belief is, is, is people's perception of their hearing loss is irrelevant to their hearing loss. And so there are other disease states where we don't ask people how they perceive it. I mean, I don't go to you and say, hey, Kat, do you feel like your high blood pressure, your blood pressure is high? No, that's not what you <laughs> that's do. That's a great example. You, you take an objective measure and it doesn't really matter if you perceive it to be high or not. It is what it is, right? I mean, you know, there are people who have, you know, body dysmorphism, which is on the other side where you, you know, perceive yourself to be perhaps of a certain weight when you're actually not that weight, right? Well, mm -hmm. scale doesn't lie. It doesn't have a motivation. It's not a brain issue, right? So to me, I think the real answer is hearing loss is an objective measure, like that we measured objectively. We're not asking you to assess your own hearing loss. You know, I would, I would almost... 90% agree with you and 10% of me wants good. to really disagree because I think that, um, yeah, it is well, because I think um, the objective measure is, is very accurate, right? Um, but 10% people inherently know when they're starting, when they're hearing you start to change. And then when they get this, this confirmation, so if, if we think it more broadly, if we've got normal hearing, we tend to occasionally have hearing difficulties, but we'll change our positioning or behavior to accommodate for that and be more confident in asking for repeats. But that as we mean age, aware no, that's, that's true. But I think, and I think it's this um, unconscious level of awareness. Sure. It's like having, you know, in a way that the back pain, I've got a bit of back pain, but I can cope when it's quite mild, but when it becomes debilitating, that's when I think I'm going to be forced to do something about it. So I, I think about it often daily and my husband will, I sometimes call him this pseudo expert in hearing because he edits all my work and he reads all my journals much to his dismay so that we can discuss it <laughs> but um I say Hamish who's my husband what I think is becoming really clear to me is that I would love people to go when they're starting to get hearing difficulties is I'm ready to do something about it let's get excited about these hearing devices that are out there and that's where I see the hearer in in this space and you and John spoke about the OTC app and the importance of it it's so important, not just for America and, what, and um, access and affordability to devices there and care, but globally because there'll be a ripple effect of what what happens in America sort of spreads across the world in a way. So um, that's where I really see you hear etching out, um, you know, being at the forefront of hearing difficulties in the mild category and then so on so forth. I'm not saying the other um, manufacturers haven't tried Sure. You know, it's an age-old problem, right? Exactly what you what you said. If it, if it was simple, some of us would have probably solved it before you and I came along. But sure. it's it's multi-dimensional because we're dealing with individual human beings and their needs. Uh, well, I guess the that, so. The way I kind of think about it is 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 if your perception. So what, one of the big things I think is the uh, wrongful synonym association between ability to communicate and hearing. And uh -huh. so what I mean by that is, and that's why I, I think it has to be objective, right? And so some people are aware and some aren't, but you know, the, the, the cognitive compensatory mechanism of speech reading and contextual processing are amazing, right? So we all know speech to text works and the biggest power of speech to text is, you know, using a, uh, a statistical model of what is the most likely words to happen before and after the word that it just spelled, right? And the deeper you yes. go, the more likely you are to make the juxtapose. Well, that's essentially what the brain does to compensate for hearing loss. And so if you're doing that unaware, that's why, you know, I, I agree that it needs to be treated. I'm just not sure percept of hearing loss. And I think, you know, the thing that OTCs will do is it will bring more people to treatment and more people to realize the benefit of amplification. So you don't know what you're missing until what you're missing is returned to you. So I think that's a huge part of treating people's hearing loss. Absolutely. And I, and I love that, um, 
there are other individuals coming into this space looking at the problem from so many different angles. That's what I love about the design thinking methodology and like you've interviewed Nick Morgan Jones on your podcast, Dave Kemp. You've you've interviewed this variety of um, thought leaders and individuals trying to work in this different manner to solve the problem and I think that's really needed in hearing health because um, someone's asked me before, oh, do you think you'll um, swap out of the hearing healthcare field and try not to solve another problem. And I said, I think I'm going to be here for the rest of my life because it's you, not. People, so you grew up in it, but people who come from outside in the medical device space, when they get into hearing, for some reason, a good number of them stay. It's like a bug. And I think it's because you get yep. user feedback, right? Like, you know, not that it's not a good thing, but if people, uh, you don't get an interaction with your hip replacement like you do with your hearing technology. So people will give you, you know, I mean, if you if you make people non-debilitated from a hip uh, replacement, that's what it is. But when people start talking about, you know, they're involved in the feedback about the tuning, it's a much different thing. In other words, where the, you know, the subjective hearing experience does matter to, to some component of it. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And Mark, let me ask you, do you use any pieces of wearable or hearable technology? I've tried them. I don't wear them on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, some of that has to just do with my lifestyle, right? So, you know, probably the place I listen to music the most is in the operating room, but I mm. need to communicate directly with the personnel around me. So I can't put in a personal listening device. So we provide ambient uh, music in that environment. Uh, the second place, the most common place I live is in my automobile. And although I know a lot of people uh, drive with uh, personal listening devices, I'm more interested in being aware of my the, the sounds around me because I think it's a safety issue. Um, so those two places. And then when I'm home, I'm involved in conversation with the ones around me. So I just haven't. I, I suspect you're wearing them right now. Oh, I am. Um... I've always worn some sort of smart device just sure. because of my involvement in sport. Right. I guess the question I was interested in from a medico point of view is where do you see this smart data um, and these data points that you're going to potentially yeah. be working with in the future and, and how do you see yourself fitting in and working with No, I think it's amazing, medico? right? It, it's like uh, somebody I was talking to today has one of those physiologic rings as well, right? So there's mm. all places that you can access data. I mean, I think it's going to be a better ability to find a deviation, right? So, you know, sure. excuse me, if you're connect, if you're collecting the data, then you look for deviations, you know, uh, aberrations within the data as a uh, signal or marker for illness, right? I mean, that's really, um, you know, and so one of the things that'll be a fascinating project that some really smart people will be taking that big data and figuring out when those uh, perturbations in the data actually uh, correlate with a problem with health, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's kind of interesting by analogy in my practice, if I order imaging, they find what we would call a, a, an incidental loma, which is just an incidental finding, right? Like it's only because you got that imaging for somebody else. Did you become aware that there is this? Absolutely. Thing. So to some extent, you're going to have a higher incidence of incidental loma health problems because all of a sudden you're going to have data that indicates maybe there's a problem. And I'm, I'm sure that's already started, right? With the smart, the more rudimentary smart device monitoring, right? I mean, you know, they 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 heavily advertise the cardiac monitoring um, mm -hmm. uh, you can put on your smartphone here and stuff. I think people want more data, right? They want more ability to know what's going on. And if nothing else, it provides reassurance. So if it doesn't, For sure. if it doesn't diagnose pathology, it mm -hmm. provide reassurance of lack of pathology. I that's so that that's so well said. I, and I totally agree. And I think there'll be a lag time in terms of uptake. I have haven't started. Yeah. I ha well, I haven't started to witness it. Um, clinically, I still do half day in a clinic and I still haven't in my head, I can envision where this smart data and personalised data collection points will get to, exactly as you described. It'll be able to just over a long period of time distinguish individuals who might have something and who don't rather than I think what I say clinically now is that individuals come in and we do snapshot testing and sampling and then we compare it to the mediums or, or the medium range or here's, here is the range, your weight range should be between here your hearing is categorised as such. And so I think in the long term, the role of professional, especially the audiologist, 
it certainly will be different because you're a medico, uh, but for the audiologist, it will be exactly as you described. We'll be able to get dynamic data in real time, analyse it and feed back to our clients sure, and give I mean, better outcomes over time. And so, uh-huh. you know, the more rudimentary ones are, you know, I mean, how exciting at the time, uh, listening times, right? So when the devices could tell you how long a patient was actually wearing something because, you mm-hmm. know, clinicians oftentimes were suspic- suspicious that the wearing times didn't really correlate with the reported wearing times, which we know. <laughs> so that's like a yes. rudimentary thing. So, I mean, you know, you could look at even more custom, you know, once people start collecting uh, data points, even from a hearing point of view of environmental things. And then like, you know, if you start figuring out what people's head gesturing is when they hear well, and then you can see that their head gesturing goes down in a certain environment, you could correlate that with a poor hearing environment and then try to adjust the prescription within the device to give them better performance in that environment. So it'll be big data with reiterative changes and these devices kind of teaching themselves how to help somebody hear better. Oh, it's, it's a really exciting time to be in the field. And I think uh, you hit on a really important point, not just in our podcast, but in other discussions on your podcast, which I love, is that we distinguish between um, the peripheral hearing system and what our auditory or central system can do. And over time, as devices, as you say, become smarter, we'll be able to detect these changes in our biomarkers. So the way we talk or um, verbalise things, is this tending to lead to a certain cognitive change? And I think... Like, and I, this is years away for me. I mean, in the next five, 10 plus, I could see this happening is that devices will be able to detect those changes inherently in all smart devices will have some level of hearing because we understand that it's a feedback loop, but it will feed into other areas of our cognition. And because I know in Australia, there's a big trend towards hearing and brain health, which is across the globe. What I'm seeing from audiological conferences is we're having a lot of guest speakers from neurology and the dementia and Alzheimer's field. So there's this big understanding. I think that this is a really important sense now and we've got, we've got to be taken seriously as professionals. And so our role as specialists in, in ears uh, is going to become really multifaceted. And the hearing and peripheral hearing testing has become so automated that we're going to focus on more the rehabilitation and where we can go. I agree. I I think probably one of the big things that people I feel is being underappreciated in the field is uh, complete rehabilitation. So what I mean by that is, is, you know, in, in our speak, making sure the hearing technology you are wearing actually what we would call meets targets, meaning it actually does fully rehabilitate you to the extent that you are able. And I think one of the unspoken things in our field is what I would call under treatment of hearing loss rather than non-treatment. So we have non-treatment is 80%. And then I hate to say this, but I think the mat- many of hearing device wearers are undertreated. And I think that that's a, uh, an issue in and of itself that where I, that's going to have to figure itself out between OTCs, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the areas I do think that you know, the audiologic field is is verification of the rehabilitation, meaning demonstrating that you actually are meeting targets with the technology you have. I think that's you. Totally. Uh, I 100% agree. Um, there's nothing, nothing more satisfying than getting somebody to their targets and then helping and then almost coaching or counseling them along to improve their daily their use. To perform, correct, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I was talking about this with Dave and Andy on a different podcast, on Dave's podcast, and I we were discussing if somebody comes to you as an audiologist, how do you feel about this scenario as an ENT opposed to the scenario? So a client comes in and they have decided that they want to have a different device to the one you've professionally recommended how does that make you feel? So the general question is, is it better for somebody to walk away with something that is underfitted or not appropriate for their hearing loss and have no rehabilitation or no fitting? Um, so versus your professional recommendation. The approach is, is you need to dispense to the patient's need, not to the patient's desire. And so, mm-hmm. for instance, you know, something we see are people with CICs completely in the canal or domes that actually cannot give them the gain 
that they need to actually rehabilitate. And I think you have an obligation. And so what I would say to you is, is if you actually go through the motion, so if you came to me and you were insistent nonetheless, and I documented that I told you you should do something else, and I documented that we gave you something and you understood you were being undertreated, and then we came to an agreement that that was through your own empowerment, you decided to do that, I don't have a problem with that. But I'm going to tell you what that scenario that I'm describing is super duper exceptional. Most people, to some extent, because of the economic nature of, of the industry, are kind of like, well, I have to cater to the need of the patient because I want to make a sale. And so there are a lot of underfit and undertreated people. And so where this really becomes a sticky issue for us as a profession is this, right? Like, so if you had, Kat, if you had high blood pressure, and I treated your high blood pressure because you were only willing to take one pill. And I took you from 210 to 110. And now you're walking around with 150 over 90. We could say your blood pressure is treated. It's just not adequately treated. And so mm -hmm. the reason we treat high blood pressure is because untreated or poorly treated high blood pressure is associated with higher incidence of heart attack. The reason we treat hearing loss is it's associated with a higher incidence of dementia. So if you haven't mitigated that dementia risk by appropriately treating people's hearing loss, are you actually doing what you should be doing? And so that I think is a huge issue that needs to be addressed. If you're going to use a medical motivator to get people to treat, then you have to actually mitigate that medical risk when you actually get them to pursue treatment. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? A hundred percent. And I really love just the, a marketing um, message. It has to be a marketing message plus an actual outcome message. Totally. And I, but I think um, I really love the description with the blood pressure, right? Because um, I think I'm a pretty fit, healthy individual. Uh, but then you said it in another podcast, your numbers could show this, but I feel this. And I right. think that's that disparity well, that value of understanding is is quite a large spectrum. Right. And Perception I think about it constantly. Your, totally. Of your of problem your is not correlating with the real problem. And that's the crux of the matter with hearing health at the end of the day. Um, so and so what I, what what I love about being in this the more the early stage of of um, rehabilitation is understanding from our clients or our consumers what's really going on because I'll they'll send me the audiograms as well. They'll do our clinically validated ear ID sure. and the audiogram and they'll send me those results. And I'll say, you are definitely a hearing aid candidate and you'll need molds. Right. And so but people still come to us. Right. Exactly. So, you know, it blows my mind that they're still really motivated to use this device. Um, and, and like you said, and it's, it's different because we're solving not a deficit problem, when you hear up because we've got accessibility and affordability, we're giving people uh, this opportunity to self-manage and that locus of control has been brought back to the, the consumer and they feel more motivated to stick with it. And, and then the cycle, the, you know, we've got this, we're, we're all human. So we get lazy, we fall off the train. We don't want to exercise in winter. We want to do more comfort things and the summer comes and you want to be more physically fit and active and eat salad and, and be healthy. So it's this perpetual cycle that humans fall into no matter how disciplined we are at the end of the day. And so the role of the professional, as you, as you said and we've discussed, is to be more holistic with our hearing health care. No, I agree 100%. But so, I mean, what I would tell you is, is the back side of that is, is I believe one of the big inhibitors of people accessing hearing healthcare is their peer poor experience. Meaning mm -hmm. many people who are around them who do not celebrate their hearing technology, they disparage it. And the reason they disparage it is because a large part of it isn't meeting targets or isn't rehabilitating them, or they haven't been counseled that it actually is rehabilitating them and they don't have that understanding. And so, you know, the reason we all people get smartphones is because you see other people have smartphones and you say, do you like your smartphone? And they say, I love it. I can't live without yes. it. So then you get your smartphone. And so it's the exact opposite negative feedback loop. And so many people come in with three people disparaging hearing care before they arrive. And so I don't think it's all price. I think there is unfortunately totally 
great outcomes with great satisfaction is so important. But the irony is about that is I've seen people who are very poorly rehabilitated who are ultimately very satisfied. So again, that doesn't, you need to be happy with your blood pressure and your blood pressure needs to be rehabilitated, <laughs> not any other combination of that. Hunt, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. It's it's multifaceted and there's there's roles for exact the medico, 100% agree, and then the audiologist and the client in the, the whole stakeholder engagement to improve that person's quality of life. I love that. Yeah, it's beyond the system. And every country is very different as well. I think uh, Australia, the US and the UK are pretty fortunate I, I with hearing health. Well, I mean, so the flip side of that is 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 – if hearing aids are economically accessible as they are in some part of Europe, so why do they have the same level of penetration? And so that particular argument question. actually undoes the, it's a price thing. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not gonna argue that access isn't an issue, but I'm not sure it actually is totally a price. I think it's a understanding the value and having value demonstrated, which, you know, you know what I'm saying. And as, as a, a, a economist from that background, it's not just price. It's the overall perceived value of what you've got. And so you're actually demonstrating to people that their hearing technology meets targets is part of demonstrating the value. And so here, mm-hmm. you no know, real measurements are underutilized. And then even in some of the offices that have it, a lot of them aren't even utilizing it, even though they have it. So there are some things that need to happen in terms of, and I think just the marketplace will push people. People will say, well, I don't want dementia. So you need to prove to me that I'm rehabilitated. So it might be a consumer driven change in practice, not a practitioner driven change in practice. Oh, I love that. Um, I think we're, we're going to have that point of conversion where the consumers and the professionals really evolve together. Uh, yeah, to deliver on part of its care. messaging, right? So what are those things that you can actually say to people to get them to move? I mean, you know, after you get the early adopters who already know they have hearing loss in your, your market, it'll be interesting to see how then do you get that next phase of people to actually be motivated to do something about it or enter into the hearing loss channel, as they call it in business, right? How do you get people into that channel? And that's a fascinating, bigger problem. It really is. And, and the other trend I'm, re- I'm seeing a lot of is the access to information across a variety of age groups. So I think we've got to That's get rid of this. Podcast, right? More access oh, 100%. To- and I love all um, the variety of speakers you've got on. When I was looking, I was like, oh, this is great. It's not just one particular niche. It's like very broad, which is exactly what our field needs to, to promote right. these other areas of specialty. But um what I'm seeing, and we've got to really get rid of this ageist comment of my clients are too old, they don't know this, and they don't want to use their smartphone to do X, Y, Z. That's fine. So is- you just drive around them, right? So you, your answer is not to change the mindset of that practitioner. It's to have the patients change the mindset. Like, so you need the fit because they, they are going to echo the same thing. Well, you know, I had people go to her for hearing aids and they didn't hear any. One returned them. The other one doesn't wear them. The third wears mm-hmm. them hear any better. Well, that's not going to get your primary care doctor to be on board with, you know, treating it. And so it becoming a medical entity makes it a big deal too, because it's like, look, this isn't just a social issue, which I think is huge. It's a medical mm-hmm. issue. Absolutely. Um, the scenario you, you described there and I was alluding to is, is my parents and it's taken, oh gosh, almost 10 years for both of them to and I'm in the field. I don't, I do not see them. <laughs> Disclaimer, I do not see my parents. Right. And I try to counsel them and nudge them here and there in, in our daily catch ups. But um, it is hard work. And I don't know if you've experienced that with any of your family members. Well, I had a brother, but no, he was poorly no. treated in hearing loss before he passed away. So that that's kind of it. But I, I mean, frankly, I deal with people with resistance all day. I mean, so, you know, a good portion of my practice is counseling people that they have a medical problem that needs to be addressed. And so I am in a position where I'm not ambiguous. I tell them you need to treat your hearing loss. Like mm-hmm. not, not, you should think about treating, even getting some of the students in my practice. So when they generate an audiologic report, they'll put patients should consider hearing aids. Well, no, actually they Mm. should, right? They shouldn't consider hearing aids. Patients should. They need them. Right. Because they have a measurable loss. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's a prescription. Yes, that's right. It's professional recommendation. And that's, and that's, we tiptoe around it as professionals. The language we use is not good. It can be read. 
That's right. Absolutely. And I was going to say, it can be reinforcing. That's us. That's who we are as professionals. We know how much evidence is is coming out of the field now for brain health and cognition in longevity sense. And not, not just a cognition by itself, the social aspects as well, which is huge. And we've always known about that. Independence, remaining independent. I mean, I always say to patients like, so when you stop hearing the conversation and you ask people to repeat themselves and then you don't ask them to repeat themselves and you slowly withdraw and then they ask you a question and you can't repeat it. What do you think they think? What they think is, is you need to go to the nursing home because you can't take care of yourself. And so yes. that is the end stage of hearing loss The people and they don't, nobody wants that. Everybody wants to stay independent. And so though that's the mm-hmm. social side, not the medical side, that's the social side. Exactly. And, and we could probably talk for hours all day um, and I'm mindful of your time as well, but in Australia, in America, what I see is that we've got these very fragmented associations, which we all register with. We're all trying to solve so many different problems and we don't have this unified outcome at the end of the day. Right. And and to me, that also um, speaks to the masses of the population about how we operate and what they can expect from us. So as an example, there's only um, one physiotherapy association here and everybody who graduates has to register with them and they report to a board, et cetera. Whereas in Australia, you have at least two or three options that I can think of. And someone might be trying to specialise more in the paediatric space a little bit and the vestibular space a little bit and so on and so forth. So because we don't have this unified approach, I think that also has this ripple effect into how we practice as professionals. And I see it in America as well. Uh, You've got at least two or three. Are, uh, it's a yes. So, you know, the dispensing, the hearing aid dispensers dispensed hearing aids before audiologists were involved. And so historically, they are the longer uh, around. And then audiologists added amplification to their practice in the 80s. And so it's mm-hmm. and uh, I would not I don't think it'd be true to say it, that they get along wonderfully. And so the chances of the two organizations merging are probably not very likely. And so that's part of the schism, okay. unfortunately. Yeah. But you know what? Yes. Patients will supersede that. They don't care about those structural uh, medical political issues. They just want to be taken care of. And so I always say there are people great in both fields and there are people terrible in both fields. So it's, you know, um, Top Gun is out, the movie right now. Mm-hmm. So um, one of the, it's actually a quote from Chuck Yeager who set the, uh, broke the uh, sound is faster than the speed of sound, but Maverick, the main character looks at one of the younger pilots and he goes, it's the pilot, not the plane. Right. And so it's the hearing care professional, not the hearing aid. Right. And so love it. Ultimately, that's what people have to understand. So there are great people coming from all sorts of walks of life. As long as people love their care about their patients, care about their outcomes and do a great conscientious job. I mean, I do think, unfortunately, on all professionally, there's some people who actually don't know they're doing a less than stellar job. They don't actually even have enough awareness themselves to know they're not doing a good job. And that the consumers will prove that as well. That's true. That. Yeah. That's a really great point. In Australia, we and and I think it's the same for your um, professionals over there. We have to maintain a certain amount of professional development points per cycle. Um, so I feel like that that's not an excuse if you're not performing you to a certain you standard. Can't, you, can't, you can't legislate excellence, right? You, you can't. Can, that's right. You can just require minimum clinical competence, and so you can't make people, for instance. You can't like say, well, you're legally required to be ethical. <laughs> people yes. Are or they're not. You cannot say, I mean, you want everybody to practice at the best level, but, you know, they pass a competency test, not an excellency test, right? If that makes mm-hmm. sense. I mean, these are big issues, but I think in a lot of ways, interestingly, technology is going to flush a lot of this out, right? And so we're going to get totally great agree. Like that. But in the end, somebody's got to fly the help you fly the plane or help you with your hearing aids. And that's where the professional is going to be, uh, or hearing treatment, as I like to call it. That's where the professionals will be involved. So I agree. This is great stuff. So um, you know, Pat, Kat, I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite sound? I love finding out what people like to uh hear and and you know, we're in the hearing space. So what is your favorite sound? I've got many, so I'll tell you two. Okay. Uh the first one is um seeing my husband uh, make our daughter laugh. I love hearing her laughter. Uh, she's two. And I think, gosh, that's incredible. Uh, I didn't think I'd be one of those parents who that really tug at my heartstrings, but. Um, so you have them in there. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's what happens, right? Baptism by fire in a way. And the no, second instant, thing. instant love affair. I mean, you know, it's an amazing thing, parenthood. Uh, I, I advocate it for everyone, but that's a side conversation. And the the other sound, I was thinking about this as I was riding to work today. We, we're in winter in the Southern Hemisphere at the moment, and I rode, or I ride to work, rain, hail, or shine. And Perth is um, infamous for being windy and sandy. And I have um, a bike that has electronic gears. And I was like, wow, that sound in summer is smooth and frictionless. But today it's crunching through the sand and the water that I've been riding through. So uh, it's a sound that made my insides churn a bit because I'm going to be cleaning my bike later today. But I love the sounds of my gears smooth when they're smooth. My bike's clean and they're smooth and um, frictionless. That's the other favorite sound. Reveal that she was a professional cyclist. Oh, yes. Oh, no, no not a professional. <laughs> I just competitive in my oh, yeah, no, no, pre-parent she, days. She, she won the Tour de France. <laughs> no, I'm totally <laughs> Oh, anyway. no. So, Kat, like, so, thanks. you know, who, who are the people you would thank? Like, so if you want to say thank you, if I said, here, you know, tell us your lifetime achievement, who are those people that you thank for getting you to where you are today? Oh, yeah. I remember you asking these questions, podcast. That's huge. But um, from a professional point of view, definitely the ENT, Dr. Chianvi at J.S. Akron, who I used to work with and my colleagues now, um, for having that conversation back in the day in his backyard when his kids were in primary school. Hey, you should seriously consider audiology. Come sit with a few of mine. I was like, oh, okay, absolutely, I will. Um, he put that on my radar and um, just great conversations around it. And we always still talk now. I'll get the, a call from him here and there after he's done a surgery and seen um, his clients, what do you think about them for this sort of um, amplification? And I was like, okay, we'll put, let's get them in, let's get in touch and discuss their case in more detail. But in a general sense, with what you've told me, this is what I think. Um, he's an, he, yeah, he's an incredible human being. Dr. Robert Patuzzi, um, those years are uh, doing my master's course, they were hard. Uh, but his vision of the future and equitable hearing health care for everybody in the world, first and third world countries, was incredible. Um, uh, I wish I had more time with him, to be honest. Sure. Um, Dr. Helen Gullius, she's our clinical director. She was all, her, her and Rob were always about the greater good when it came to hearing health, and, and that's Wonderful. sort of how I'm thinking. Um, and then, of course, to my stubborn, stubborn parents who don't listen to me even though I'm a professional, and that's probably where I get my tenacity from. And my husband as well, because he edits everything. Lots of influences out there. That's I great. also like to look outside of our field, but there's a snapshot of something. So I appreciate those questions, Mark, and your time. Yeah, and this Thank is Kat you. She's the director of hearing health at New Here. Kat, if, if people want to get a hold of you, how would they get a hold of you if they want to contact you? Absolutely. So you can um, add me on LinkedIn. I'm always open to any conversations. Um, Twitter is also another space that I, I like hopping on to. So Twitter and LinkedIn are my two prominent accounts. No, this has been great. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. I mean, I think these are really big issues that we as a, a hearing health community are going to have to tackle. And I think there are a lot of people coming from a lot of great directions. And it'll be great to even visit this in three, you know, to see how quickly it's changing. So uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks so much for your time and your amazing insights as well, Mark. Thanks. I appreciate it. So this has been great, Kat. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.